Hello, my friends. We're continuing today our series on the Jewish way in mourning. Last week when we spoke via YouTube, I was able to share with you that for the most part, almost everything that transpires from the time of death through the actual burial is focused on the Jewish tradition of kavod hamet, which means showing full honor and respect to the dead. The tradition says that it's impossible to comfort the mourner at that moment in time, between the time of death and the time of burial. Words go nowhere. We hold our comforting of the mourner until after the burial, truly so. Up until burial, it's kavod hamet, honoring the dead. And we do it by, as I spoke to you last week, having the shomer, the watcher, the way in which there is the tahara, the ritual purification, and naturally the funeral service itself. It is supposed to honor, honor the memory of the deceased. We all know that the central portion of the funeral service is the eulogy, or the hespade, as it's called in Hebrew. Now, the eulogy has to be special. It has to, in some way, convey to those who were there that day what were the commitments, the convictions, the values of the deceased. It has to say to those who were there what that person valued or cherished or treasured in life. It has to say what that person felt good about in life, what he or she saw as his or her accomplishments and achievements. It should convey the lessons of a person's life. It should be a statement about the meaning of that life for the family and extending beyond the family as well. I must tell you some of the, some of the most wonderful eulogies I have given have been enriched by the words that people have left with me. They have left me statements, letters, which shared with me what they wanted to have said about them during the course of their eulogy. I learned a lot by reading these words, and then once I did, I was able to bring them into the eulogy in a way in which I think allowed them to speak so powerfully, even after their death. Before the, cer the ceremony begins, there is the tradition of kriya, which means the cutting. The cutting of a garment by Jewish tradition, although many, of course, today cut the black ribbon. The tradition itself goes far back in time. Jacob, Yaakov, our patriarch, he cut Kriya when he was told that his son Joseph had perished. So it's a tradition that goes back to the time of our Torah. And why? Why do we cut Kriya? Because symbolically it has meaning. It is supposed to symbolize that for us there is a tear in the heart. It symbolizes that there is a tear in the fabric of family life. And then it also symbolizes that there is a brokenness. There is a brokenness in life symbolized by the tear that says life has been broken. Originally, Kriya was there, and it still could be or should be, to reflect that there is an anguish that needs in some way to be expressed. So our people tore a garment. They tore it out of anger. They tore it out of anguish. They tore it out of their feelings. And that's the garment that they wore for Shiva. So which should it be? Should it be the garment, or it should be the ribbon? Now, many of you know that I follow the tradition of tearing a garment. For a parent on the left side over the heart, for everyone else over the right side. 
I follow that tradition because I think it most powerfully expresses what mourning is all about. It expresses that feeling of being torn. It expresses that brokenness in a much better way than I think that a black ribbon does. And you wear that garment through the period of Shiva, and wherever you walk in the Shiva home, your garment there tells you and tells others that someone that you love so very much has left this world and that there is truly a tear in your heart. Who tears the garment? Who does Kriya? Well, one of those who are obligated by our tradition to mourn. A son, a daughter, a father, a mother, a sister, a brother, or a spouse. Seven relatives in all. So for one of those seven relatives, we, of course, do the tradition of Kriya. And as we do, we say a blessing. Baruch atah Hashem Elokeinu Melech HaOlam Dayan HaEmet which means, Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, righteous judge. At that moment, we say that we trust in God and we turn our beloved over to the care and the love of God for the rest of eternity. So the eulogy, the ceremony, and then we begin the procession to the cemetery. I want you to know that the term in Hebrew for funeral is Leviah. And Levaya means actually to accompany, to accompany the dead. In traditional circles, you will often see that there would be a crowd of people gathering behind the hearse and walking for a block or two or three to symbolically at least escort the deceased towards the cemetery. And once at the cemetery, when the casket is removed from the hearse, it is carried by family and friends believing as we do that that is our, that is our duty, that is our obligation, that is our act of love. But family and friends walk behind. They walk behind up to the graveside. And I want to say two things. Number one, there is a custom in America of what the funeral directors call a holdback. That the family stays back, but the funeral director and the pallbearers and the rabbi go up to the grave because the family doesn't want to be at the grave at the time of the, of the actual lowering of the casket. The tradition says, as hard as it is, we should accompany our loved one to their final resting place. And we should carry that person to his or her final resting place. We should be there. These are people who carried us in life, who lifted us up in life, and so we should lift them up and carry them and be with them. The casket is lowered and the earth is placed into the grave. Ideally, we fill the entire grave up, but at least we cover the casket. For those who think that, well, I'm throwing dirt on my loved one, I don't want to do that, that's not what we're doing. We're tucking our loved ones in to the earth for eternity, giving, giving them a blanket of earth. We are doing the last thing that we can do for them. In our tradition, it is called a chesed shel emet, it is considered to be as everything that we do for the deceased. It is a true act of kindness to do this ourselves for them, knowing that there cannot be any payback, any payback whatsoever for our kindness and love. The shoveling is done in a special way. First, the shovel is turned backwards to show our reluctance to do so. And then we begin the shoveling, not passing the shovel from one to the next. Well, that's where I want to end to, for now, because next week we transition into the, the comforting of the bereaved. Thanks very much, and I'll speak to you next week.